you. It's good to be back again uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, I have a confession to make. Sometimes I miss things. Um, I am usually a very observant person, but uh, sometimes I, I miss things. Um, now, my wife, if she was here, she might tell you that it's more often than sometimes, but... Uh, we used to live in suburban Baltimore, uh, where I'm from, and uh, we lived just a mile from Interstate 95. There were Lincoln Christian University used to have a campus there, and that's where I did my undergraduate degree. That's where I met my wife. Uh, I lived there for 11 years, and the road that connected to Interstate 95 ran right in front of where we lived. Now, I couldn't tell you how many times I had driven down that road in five years, but one day, I had turned left out of our driveway, I was on that road, and I looked to the right and I said, wow, they built that water tower pretty quickly. And my soon-to-be wife said, that's always been there, Frank. <laughs> it happens, right? Sometimes we miss things, sometimes we overlook things. Um, I, I actually, in the text, uh, in scripture we're going to look at today, I missed something. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you have a Bible or an app, uh, feel free to turn over there. I, look, I, I am a professor of New Testament. It's literally my job not to miss these sorts of things. But I have to admit, um, I didn't see it before preparing for this sermon. The text it may be familiar to you if you've been around church for any amount of time. It's, it's the body of Christ text from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now, if you've not been around church very much, you are the body of Christ might be an odd thing to hear, but for Christians, it's a common metaphor. The concept is Christ is the head, and then everyone else is a metaphorical body. It's the launching point for service to the church and to the world. Part of what this passage is about is that you have something to contribute here. But there is more going on here than that. So, what did I miss? Let's look at the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. As Paul begins this section, what he says in short is our identity as Christians is bound up in Christ and the church. Chad Bird, a writer for the 1517 Project, uh, you can look up the website, says this, Christianity is not about a personal relationship with Jesus. That phrase is never found in the Bible, and the whole biblical witness runs contrary to it. Our life with Christ is communal, not personal or private or individual. When the Scriptures speak of believers, they are part of a community, a fellowship of other believers. That might be shocking to you. It might be contrary to what you've heard for a very long time. I would contend it is also true. Both of the verses I just read make the point. The body metaphor emphasizes this. Bodies, as you well know, have many parts. To state the obvious, we together are the many different parts of Christ's body. That gets expounded upon later in the passage. But the last phrase of verse 12 is the key. Look back at your Bibles. Verse 12, he says, Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with... What you'd expect him to say there is the church. Right? That's not what he says. So it is with Christ. The identification of Christians with Jesus is so complete, so total, so all-encompassing that Paul literally here speaks of the church as Christ. So the reality is, if you want to be a Christian, you have to live with all of us. When I was asking my soon-to-be father-in-law 
if I could marry his daughter. I remember one of the things he said to me, amidst all of the other threats that he made, (laughs) was that if you choose to go through with marrying Jill, my wife now, he said, you get the whole family. That's church, isn't it? If you come here, you get us all. And Paul explains that thought in verse 13, 4, he says, 4. And he talks about baptism. Baptism baptism is not just incorporation into the life of Christ, but it's incorporation into the life of the church. Look at how Paul reorients their identity. He says, either you can be Jew or Greek, but none of that matters anymore. The primary ethnic and religious markers of his day are subsumed in the communal life of the church. You could be slaves or free in Paul's world. And he says, those primary socioeconomic markers in the ancient world are subsumed in the communal life of the church. We all have our list of identity markers. But the reality of this passage is that our identity is bound up in Christ and church, not our jobs, not how much money we make, not sexuality or gender, not the teams we root for or are part of, not the brand we choose to create on social media, not our abilities, not whether we're Republicans or Democrats. Our thinking is misguided if as Christians our identity is not in Christ and church. But that wasn't the thing I missed in this text. I, I knew that. The next section of text here in 1 Corinthians 12 says, because we are joined together in a single body, all of our diverse gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the church. There seems to have been a problem with the Christians in Corinth. They knew that they were part of the body of Christ. They knew they were all Christians. They knew their identity had been subsumed in Christ and church. What they did, however, was started ranking, in order of importance, the spiritual gifts they had. They created a hierarchy. Not only were some viewed as more important, but they increased their social standing by that as well. Now, you would need to read through all of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 to do that, to see that. I encourage you to do that. We don't have time for that this morning. But it seems as though speaking in tongues in the church was held in the highest esteem. There were other gifts. People were prophesying, teaching, leading, lending assistance. But they were seen as as imparting as much honor as speaking in tongues. Now, for Paul... There's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues per se. There's nothing wrong with any spiritual gift. The problem is the belief that some are more important than others. And the natural consequence of belief that some are more important or honorable is that others are then viewed as less important or less honorable. And that's what Paul is attempting to dispel in this section. Look at verse 14. A church cannot function without diverse gifts. Indeed, he says... The body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Now, if the whole body were an eye, where would hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. Paul extends the metaphor in several directions here. Those, he says, who are viewed by the church in Corinth as less than, you can't remove yourself because of that. First, there is no inferior. In the body, there is only equally important. I mean... Goodness, what's more important, a foot or a hand? The Corinthians knew this. In ancient Corinth, there was a temple to the Greek god Asclepius, and part of the worship of Asclepius was to make a cast of a body part that needed healing. Uh, I have a picture here, if uh, they put it on the screen maybe. 
These are some casts of legs that were made by worshipers of Asclepius in ancient Corinth. There's a little museum in the archaeological site there. If you ever have the opportunity to go, you can see this for yourself. They would take the cast of the body part that needed healing, put it in the temple to Asclepius, make an offering of money or something else, and then they would offer prayers and hope that the God would come and heal their body part. Because, as we all know, when we're injured or lose body parts, that's painful. If you've ever been around someone who's had that experience, you know the anguish of it. When I was a pastor in Maryland, there was a a 19-year-old kid who was working a brake press in a factory. And I was in the room in the hospital when the doctors told him that he was going to lose these three fingers because of an accident at work. The scream he let out when he heard that news still haunts me. A oh, finger, right? How oh, we can do without him? How? Probably not. In the church, we can't rid ourselves of the seemingly inferior. That's painful. If you've ever been made to feel inferior in church, whoever did that to you is wrong. Everyone here is equally important and valuable. It doesn't make any sense to value one part over the others. Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If you've seen the old uh, Monty Python show, uh, the Monty Python's Flying Circus, I always think of the the, the giant cartoon foot that... um, the Monty Python, uh, Terry Gilliam, the artist, made. That's not a body, is it? But this is the same metaphor that Paul makes here. If the whole body were a foot, where's everything else? That's no body at all. For the Corinthians, speaking in tongues is seen as the most valuable contribution anyone could make. What Paul's saying is it's good, but it's not any better than any other gift. Like them, we have a similar tendency to rank gifts, attach status to them. You know, as someone who stands up front. Teaching adults versus teaching children. Giving money versus giving time. All of those things are necessary. They're all equal. One is not more important than the others. The reality is we need everyone here. And we need everyone contributing to the healthy functioning of the church. All of our gifts are necessary. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21, continuing on. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. One part cannot say to another, you are not necessary. Last year, uh, my wife and I were having a new floor, put in our kitchen. And in order to save a little bit of money, I was going to take out the old flooring, get it down to the subfloor, get it ready for the contractors to go. So in doing that, I thought, I just want to get this done as quickly as possible. And right off of our kitchen, there's a door that leads to the garage. So scrape up, scrape up, scrape up, tear up the quarter round, all of this stuff. And I'm just chucking it into the driveway, right? Clear the room. I can deal with that later. So I get the kitchen all cleaned out. Then I go outside to take care of the mess in the driveway that I've made and immediately stepped on a nail. 
straight through the bottom of my shoe into my foot, and of course I crumple in the driveway with a board stuck to my foot. Pulled it out of my shoe, took my shoe off, already blood covering my sock, so I crawl inside, and I, I'm home by myself at this point. I crawl through the downstairs, I crawl upstairs to where we keep the medicine cabinet, and all of this stuff, and I clean it up, and it doesn't look too bad. So I put a clean sock on, put my shoe back on, and went back outside and cleaned up the mess. After a little while, I was done, decided to take a break, sat down with a glass of iced tea, took my shoes off, and my big toe on my right foot was about three times its normal size. And I called my wife and I said, I'm going to be at the urgent care. Now, if you think something uh, small and insignificant as a big toe is not necessary for the proper functioning of your body, I can assure you, it is. Later last year, November, I'm in San Antonio for a conference, and I'm out with my friends, and we're on bird scooters. Have you seen these? You rent them with an app. People are riding them around St. Louis, things like that. And my buddy, just by accident, happened to bump me and I fell off the scooter, and I realized immediately, it didn't hurt, but I knew immediately something was wrong with my left leg. I couldn't bend it, so they called an ambulance. I went to the hospital in San Antonio. Uh, they took an x-ray, and they said, do you want to see it? Sure. It's bad. Okay. And my kneecap was in many pieces. Okay. Uh, I came home the day after Thanksgiving. I had surgery in February. I had to have a second surgery, lots of physical therapy. Um, if you could tell, I'm more still wearing a compression sleeve on my left knee. Now, a kneecap isn't very much. It's only about this big. But if you think you can function without one, I can assure you from experience, you cannot. It's those smaller, seemingly insignificant, weaker, less honorable parts of the body that are indispensable to its healthy functioning. John Chrysostom, the great preacher of the 5th century, said this, What is meaner than a foot? And what is more honorable than the head? For this, the head, more than anything, is the person. Nevertheless, it could not do everything on its own. The greater have need of the less, for nothing is dishonorable, seeing it is God's work. Paul says in verse 24, God put the body together to give greater honor to those parts. Teresa of Avila, the great spiritual writer of the 16th century, said this, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is going about doing good. Yours are the hands with which God is to bless people now. And because we are all joined together in a single body, all of our diverse gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the church. But I knew that too. That wasn't the thing I missed in this text. What I missed is in the last section of this passage that I've read and I've studied numerous times. Come back to the, the text one more time. Verse Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now, he says, you are the body of Christ and individually members in it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. After everything I've just said, does that strike you as odd? It does me. Paul has just spent a major section of this letter saying there is no ranking of gifts. And then he says... First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. 
He said that no one gift is greater than the others. And then he says in this paragraph, strive for the greater gifts. What is going on here? Paul is not stupid. I would contend there is no ranking here. The gifts he lists in this little paragraph are listed in order needed to establish Christian communities, not in order of importance or status granting or honor. In Paul's world, they needed apostles and prophets and teachers. And once they had those things to establish a Christian community in a place like Corinth, everything else falls into place as people come and begin contributing in the church. It was that little statement, strive for the greater gifts that I missed. And it sent me searching to try to sort this out. What could that possibly mean? It cannot mean that there are gifts that bestow more honor, that some gifts are more important than others, that some are more necessary than others. Verse 31, he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Now, unfortunately, our Bibles have chapters and verses in them. But when Paul wrote this letter, it did not. I will show you a still more excellent way is what we know as 1 Corinthians 13. If you look at chapter 13, verse 13, just maybe on the same page or the next page in your Bible. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Strive for greater gifts. The greatest of these is love. In Greek, that's the same word, greater and greatest. The greater gifts, I would argue, are those that are motivated by love toward others and not love of oneself. And that can be done by anyone. And that can be anything in the church as long as it's done to build up the church. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Let all things be done for building up. I can't believe I missed that. I preached nearly every Sunday for eight years. I preached this text. I have five advanced theological degrees, including a PhD from a top 20 world university. I am quite literally a professional Christian. And I miss that. It's easy to get caught up in finding spiritual gifts, finding places to serve, especially in smaller churches. Things need to get done, right? That we miss the motivation to do so. Ultimately, this text is not really about what I do for the church. It's about why I do it. And the why must be a love that seeks to build you up. I am here for your benefit. You're here for mine. Honestly, I cannot believe I missed that. I just don't want you to make the same mistake I did. Let's pray. Father, I am grateful for the church. I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for these folks. I'm grateful for the church I attend. We're grateful for opportunities to serve. I just pray that as we, we go about those things, and whatever it is is necessary, whatever it is is important, I just pray that as we go about those things that we keep in mind that it's because we love people that we do it. And we want to see them built up, not ourselves. In Jesus' name.